Okay, so uh, let us start today's uh, lecture. Uh, so welcome all of you and also special welcome uh, to Professor Matthew Shidagis uh, from the University of Albany, uh, the State University of New York. Um, he is going to talk to us today on the dual phase xenon based time projection chamber, DPC for short. Uh, just to give a couple of uh, lines of introduction about uh, Professor Matthew Chiragues, uh, he received his BA, MS, and PhD all from the University of Chicago in 2005 and 6 and 11, respectively. And then he continued his work in physics as a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, Davis, uh, between 2010 and 14 for four years. And since 2014, he has been an assistant professor at the University of Albany uh, Department of Physics, uh, pursuing experimental particle astrophysics, uh, in particular, the direct laboratory detection of dark matter, uh, in particular, weekly interacting massive particles, of, uh, which are called beams underground, and uh, general detector development for rare event searches. Uh, he works on the LUX, that is, uh, which stands for Large Underground Xenon, as well as LZ which is uh, liquid, which stands for liquid xenon-based uh, experiments. And he's also the developer of the NEST, which stands for Noble Element Simulation Technique software, uh, which is quite popular, I understand. And uh, also uh, the snowball chamber, uh, incidentally about which he's going to uh, talk later this month uh, in the same series. Uh, so the snowball chamber, super cool water technology which is useful for both dark matter as well as neutrino physics projects and other experiments. So with that uh, brief introduction of today's speaker, uh, I request Matthew to start his lecture. Thank you so much, Satya, for your kind uh, introduction and for um, inviting me today. So I'd like to thank you as the host and thank the, the um, INO, India Neutrino Observatory. I think it's wonderful that you're doing this uh, a series, and I'm very uh, uh, proud and happy to be participating in international outreach like this. I think in these difficult uh, times um, where, you know, it's difficult to travel in person internationally, I think that these kinds of um, uh, collegial events where we reach across, you know, thousands of miles and oceans are very important in, in these times. So um, thank you so much once again for inviting me. So today I'm going to give a talk I have not given before. So I usually, I talk about dark matter or I'll talk about neutrino physics or I'll talk about a specific a physics topic. But today I want to focus on this instrument, the, the time projection chamber, specifically the xenon-based time projection chamber, and try to talk about all of its broad applications. It's not just about dark matter, my primary field. It's about neutrino physics and so many other things. It is a broad-based tool. And I have been using this tool um, only recently. I'm very young compared to the great men and women who have gone before me who developed this technology and led the original experiment. So I hope I do them justice and do the history justice of this technology in only one hour. There's only so much I can cover, but I'm going to try to put this into the, into a broad context of the history and the broad applications of this technology. So here's an outline of what I'm going to be talking to you about in the next hour. So first a brief history of the TPC and the original design, a summary of different types of, piece, uh, of TPCs, the application to dark matter, specifically in the search for WIMPs, L a look at the Xenon and LuxLZ programs, then um, a brief look at to the microphysics of what is happening at the atomic level in uh, is particularly in a liquid Xenon TPC. Then even though, so this is a general talk this is not a talk on LZ or Lux, my experiments. Use the LZ experiment as an example to break down some of the aspects of TPCs. Look at the historical, um, how, in the his how in the field, at least of dark matter, how TPCs have really been uh, leading the way. Um, look at how they're deployed in underground locations, particularly surf in South Dakota. And then 
again, emphasizing how this is a broad-based technology, look, we're going to move away then from dark matter and look at neutrinoless double beta decay, talk about the EXO and NEXT experiments, which are TPCs, talk about well, what has already been discovered with TPC? So we have not found dark matter yet, but what has what have we been able to do? And then at the end, make the connection between liquid xenon TPCs and liquid argon, which are extremely similar. And liquid argon TPCs have been used for both dark matter and also in a really big way in neutrino physics. So that's a, that's a summary of where we're, what, what we're going to be talking about uh, today over the next hour. So first, let's ta talk briefly about the history of the TPC. I'm not a historian or science historian, but a, but a scientist, but I think it's important to put things into context um, and also give credit where, where, where it is due. So the, the TPC, just like the bubble chamber, is a very general particle detection technology, radiation detection technology that started originally, didn't have to do anything, to, it had nothing to do with dark matter, um, um, or neutrino physics uh, originally. So the, the TPC or the time projection chamber as it stands for was de developed by U.S. physicist Dave Nygren at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in the 1970s. Um, here's a, a recent photo of, of, of Dave. He's alive and well and working very hard still on TPCs. He is currently uh, the Presidential Distinguished Professor of Physics at the University of Texas at Arlington, um, back when he was still at Berkeley Lab, and I was at UC Davis, so that's not that far away in the Bay, Al Bay Area in California um, in the U.S. I did have the, um, uh, the pleasure um, and the privilege of meeting him. Um, his uh, TPC idea was a new method in the 1970s for three-dimensional position reconstruction. So, and uh, again, abroad across different fields of physics for detection of particles. So you get the radial position or XY from grid wires in a TPC. Um, and the third dimension comes from the drift time between um, an initial signal and a later signal in the TPC. So the big innovation of the TPC that eliminated ambiguities in position reconstruction from earlier technologies is getting the third dimension by electrons that drift across a space in the TPC. And so that time is then converted using the velocity of the electrons drifting. The time is converted into a distance and that distance then gives you a third, the third dimension. So the TPC technology allows for three-dimensional position reconstruction. So the original design, so here's um, a, a, a photo of, uh, of a TPC I I installation. Um, this is one of the originals. So this is from, um, I got it from uh, this talk down here. There was, a, but this is, so this is a photo by Jay Marks from the Nigran Fest uh, talk a few years ago. So you can see it the, being lowered by the crane here. So many technical challenges had to be overcome like with any new technology, but never. But the basic design is quite simple. So an incoming particle produces ionization. So that means electrons are ripped out of atoms by a particle, an, a, a, by an external source of radiation zips through and rips electrons off of atoms. So these are the, these liberated electrons are then drifted in an electric field. So the TPC is kind of like a giant um, battery. You have an electric field that takes the electrons from their origin point and drifts them to one of the ends, so where they can be uh, detected, counted. So there is a drift access axis, which is defined by the electric field. So in the, the photo here, so the electric field would be, is along the axis of symmetry of the cylinder going in and out of the photo. There's also a parallel, not perpendicular, but parallel magnetic field that suppresses diffusion of electrons. And that allows you to get, to drift electrons long distances um, without them spreading apart. So that means you have good position. You don't just have 3D position reconstruction. You also have good three-dimensional position resolution. So modern liquid xenon-based TBCs, for example, can have um, uh, 
centimeter or even millimeter, uh, a submillimeter uh, resolution uh, at, at high energy. So good position uh, reconstruction. So you have some sort of sensors um, that are two dimensional at the ends, the two ends of the TPC, the two ends of the cylinder. And when you couple those sensors at the ends that give you the two dimensional information, you then get the third dimension from the drift time across the electric field. And so that's how you get, again, 3D uh, position reconstruction. So diffusion is one of the problems the TPC uh, tries to solve. So as electrons drift upwards in a gas or in a liquid, even they'll spread apart in an electric field. So a, the cloud of electrons will diffuse. And that's bad because then when you try to reconstruct the position instead of a nice tight peak, you get an error, you get an uncertainty on what the XY position was of your original interaction. So the other problem is, is that you need to purify your gas or your liquid in your TPC so that electrons don't get absorbed by impurities, oxygen, water, or you know, other electronegative impurities that eat electrons and will not allow them to get to the ends of your detector and be counted. So these are the challenges that have to be overcome. And in the original design, a magnetic containment field essentially helps shape the diffuse, the cloud of electrons that's diffusing to keep them tight so that they can arrive in later technologies they'll talk about like with liquid xenon the density of the liquid and field in the liquid helps you don't need a specific separate magnetic field but in the original design one of the innovations was electric field for drifting but also a magnetic containment field and whenever i hear that phrase magnetic containment field though it reminds me of the antimatter containment field for the warp drive in star trek so I always try to throw Star Trek into my talk since it's one of the reasons I became a physicist. So it's got to always have at least one Star Trek joke in there. So but with, between the electric and magnetic fields, you move the electrons and you constrain them so that you can use, so that instead of this diffuse cloud, like in my animation here, you keep them tight in a, in a, in a closer to a nice bunch. You can never make them completely point-like, but you keep the electrons as a tight bunch that then gives you a reliable reconstruction of position within the detector. So there are diff many different types of TPCs now, both gas and liquid versions. The original was gas only. The bent, and there's even ideas now for solid, for solid xenon. There's um, Michelle Delinsky, Peter Sorensen, many uh, physicists are considering a solid as well, but I, there hasn't been a, a large version of that constructed yet, but there's all kinds of innovation since the, the original idea. So the benefits of using a liquid instead of gas is high density, which means that diffusion that I just talked about is less of a problem. So you don't need a magnetic field, a B field, for instance. And the, uh, the other benefit of liquid is more target mass for rare event searches in dark matter or neutrino physics. The drawbacks of liquid are that you're not gonna see tracks anymore, except at very high energy. So in liquid argon TPCs, I'll talk about at the end, even though they're liquid, you still see tracks. But at low energies, tracks become impossible because the liquid is a liquid is much denser than a gas, of course. So you, you just see point-like interactions. And while your position resolution is still good, your energy resolution may be poor compared to gas for various reasons. So there are benefits and drawbacks to every type of TPC we've developed. So now we have both one and two phase versions. So one phase versions are 100% liquid or 100% gas. Two phase versions are mostly liquid with a bit of gas. And we'll talk about what the purpose is served by that second phase uh, later. And so we're going to, I want, I'm mo many of my slides in the middle of my talk and the heart of my talk are going to focus on liquid and on two phase as the title of my talk said, since in particular, that's the technology um, that I work on in my daily research. So th that's where most of my uh, focus is going to be. And I'm also going to focus on uh, noble elements in particular, xenon and mention argon as well. So the benefit, so you can use, TPCs have been made with all different kinds 
of gases and liquids. They all have their own advantages and disadvantages. In noble elements, the advantages, we're no longer talking just about ionization. So in addition to counting electrons, you're also counting photons. So in noble elements like xenon and argon, they don't just produce electrons. They also produce photons. They produce light, typically in the ultraviolet range. So that means you're counting two different kinds uh, you have two different channels that you use to study interactions in the TPC. You're counting photons and you're also counting electrons. There are many applications, different fields of physics we'll cover today. Mine, again, is only dark matter. It's far from the only one. And since, of course, this is part of a talk for the India-based neutrino observatory, the INO, um, I will make the connection, of course, to neutrino physics, even though that's not my primary field. I want to make the connection also to the elusive neutrino particle as well. So, but I want to start with the application to dark matter. So there have been, there are several, there have been several extremely successful liquid xenon-based TPCs um, the one, the first one I'll mention, it's actually, I don't work on this experiment. I work on the competition, but I want to be fair today and balance and talk about all the different, all the different experiments, including the ones, you know, I'm competing with working on Luxnell Z. So there's the Xenon series of experiments based on Xenon, also named Xenon, the word, the just Xenon, the element, all caps is the name of the experimental collaboration. And so you have here the history of the Xenon experiment and projection in the future, the Xenon 10, 100, 1 ton, N ton, and then um, N ton is under, is, is being, um, is turning on right now. Um, and then there's Darwin projected for the uh, future. So you can see the different masses of, you can see the different masses of the different um, experiments, they've been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, we have not found dark matter. And so we keep building bigger and bigger detectors to create bigger target masses. So listed here is the total amount of xenon. We've gone from 25 kilograms to 7.5 tons today in the future, looking at 50 ton scale detectors. The difference between the total and the target is that the target refers to the subset. You'll see it's always a smaller number. It refers to the subset of the mass where there's an electric field. So not all the mass is usable. So some of the xenon is in the cracks and crevices, outer portions of the detector. So the target mass you see listed on my slide is, all, is lower than the total. And then even lower than that is something called the fiducial mass. So the word fiducial refers to the, the innermost mass you use for your data analysis. You take a subset, the innermost core of the TPC, and you cut the outer edges of the uh, of the detector out of your analysis because that's where all the background radiation will be. And if you're conducting a rare event search, like looking for uh, dark matter, then you want to ignore all the naturally occurring sources of the radiation that statistically will be predominantly in the outer edges of the detector. So that's why this number you see called fiducial the third number in each column is an even smaller number than total or target. That's the heart of your detector, the innermost mass, the innermost radius and volume. And you can see the years here of achievements, 2007, 15, 19. Xenon N-ton, it says projected 2022. It's actually turning on right now. Um, in Italy, so that's actually, so this is an outdated figure I got from the Xenon uh, a collaboration from one of their talks, but it's still, um, the numbers are, are still accurate for the uh, masses. And these last numbers here, the limit is while dark matter was not discovered by these TPCs, a limit was set on the interaction cross-section. These are incredibly small numbers, 10 to the minus 43 10 to the minus 45, 47, 48, and projection for the next generation, 10 to the minus 49. So these are incredibly small numbers, and they're in units of, of square centimeters. They're in units of surface area, and they refer to the interaction probability for dark matter particles. So Xenon 10 at the left here was the first Xenon TPC used to seek dark matter, which dark matter is, could be the subject of its own talk. 
And as part as the I and O talk series, I saw you, there's already been talks about dark matter. I don't have time to launch into it today because I'm focusing on the technology and not only on the physics applications. I want to get to all of them. So in case you don't know what the heck dark matter is and you didn't see one of the earlier talks, I'm only going to give a brief one sentence now and tell you that it's just a it is a theoretical form of matter that we have a lot of evidence for from astronomy but we and, and cosmology, but we don't have direct evidence of what it is in the lab, some new form of matter that interacts primarily gravitationally. It would be the subject of its own one-hour talk, so I can't get into it. But Xenon 10 was the first two-page Xenon TBC used to seek dark matter. Um, and, and the spokeswoman of the Xenon collaboration, this whole, to, for across all these experiments, is Professor Elena Prile of Columbia University. So the luck, Xenon 10, actually, uh, 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 after Xenon 10 came two distinct competing experiments, Lux, which is I work on, and Xenon 100, that were similar in mass and in timing. So Lux is an acronym that stands for Large Underground Xenon. There was additionally Zeppelin, um, centered in the UK, but also other international partners, and then the Panda X experiment in, in China. And so this technology, TPC, has become so popular because of how well it works, so that multiple competing experiments have grown up. You know, everyone wants that Nobel Prize discovering dark matter. And so multiple competing experiments have cropped up around the world. So Lux had world-leading limits, so not discovery, but limits on, on the uh, parameter space of dark matter for many years. It's been led by co-spokesman co Professor Rick Gageskill of Brown University and Dan McKinsey of Berkeley. And in between Xenon 100 and 1 ton, Lux had world-leading limits for several years in a row. So these competing experiments tend to leapfrog each other, going, you know, one is the best for a couple of years, then the next one's the best for a couple of years. And while the Xenon, so these are these TPCs are deployed around the world, the Xenon series has been deployed in Italy, in Gran Sasso, inside of a mountain, actually, you can drive right in, whereas Lux and then LZ is deployed at the Sanford Underground Re Research Facility in South Dakota. So the LZ experiment is a joining of forces of Lux and Zeppelin have these two competing experiments have joined forces to build one detector. So there's going to be a new detector that's being assembled right now in Leed, South Dakota called LZ, which stands for Lux Zeppelin, that then competes with Xenon um, N-ton, the next generation upgrade of Xenon 1-ton. So it gets very confusing. And I'm often, you know, and my colleagues were mistaken for working for the opposite experiment. And it's like, you know, being confused of liking Pepsi instead of Coca-Cola. So there are all these, you know, very, very near identical TPCs that are all um, uh, competing with the same technology in order to be the first uh, to uh, observe dark matter. So I wanted to be fair, so I started the competition with Xenon. Here is the Lux LZ series. So Lux and Lux Zeppelin, it's upgrade LZ. Here's a picture showing you a person for scale. Um, so the LZ experiment will be significantly larger, more liquid xenon than the, than the Lux experiment. And so it's going to be an upgrade from a few hundred kilograms to uh, a 10-ton scale experiment, of which the innermost five and a half tons of liquid is what is called the fiducial uh, mass. So the, um, the LZ experiment is currently the, our, 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 our um, our democratically elected current uh, spokesman is Dr. Kevin Lesko of, ne of Berkeley, of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories, currently um, leading the LZ experiment. Um, currently, one of my roles in the LZ experiment is the co-convener of what's called the Time Dependent Signals Group. So LUX is done now. There's no new data taking. It's been disassembled. We're assembling LZ. However, there's still plenty more papers coming out for LUX looking for different types of dark matter or doing neutrino physics, during non-dark matter physics um, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the LUX experiment. So LUX is still going strong. So all these numbers I'm quoting for you for cross-section, what do these mean? So we have not discovered a new particle. We have not discovered dark matter, but we set limits on what its interaction probability can be. So the kinds of numbers we're dealing with, I want to show you how many zeros that is converting from scientific notation to normal. You can see at the top of my slide. So 10 to the minus 46, what does that mean? That means zero point, then 45 zeros and a one. 
So we've been ruling out vast amounts of parameter space on where the dark matter uh, can be hiding. So what does the disease, these tiny numbers mean? What does cross-section mean in physics? I want to take an aside for what this means. All these TPC experiments quote something called cross-section that can be very hard to understand. And cross-section is important to dark matter, to neutrino physics, to all of particle physics. So here's a cartoon with um, pool balls, with billiards. Um, and this, this V-shaped thing is actually the Greek letter N means neutrino. So this is even a neutrino, not a dark matter example. So you can think about um, particles, subatomic particles even, or atoms as if they were, you know, pool balls. It's not obviously not a perfect analogy. Um, disregards many phenomena to think of them as hard spheres, but it's nevertheless a good analogy to think about interactions. And it sounds strange to quote two-dimensional units for three-dimensional objects like atoms and subatomic particles, but this is how probability of interaction is quantified in particle physics, in high energy physics, in dark matter and the neutrino fields. And it is rarely is this literally a geometric surface area, but nevertheless, because the probability of interaction is quoted as surface area. It's often better, slightly better than the pool analogy or billiards is darts is to think about throwing darts at a dartboard. Your dartboard is your TPC and your darts are your particles, neutrons, betas, gammas, or hopefully dark matter. Also you want to interact with your detector. So the dartboard analogy is kind of a better analogy for thinking about um, why is the probability of interaction quoted as surface area? So even though these are three-dimensional objects, right, atoms and subatomic particles that are colliding, they're colliding the way, these, the way the collisions work. It's actually mathematically turns out to be, it's better to think of these collisions head-on as, as a two-dimensional um, a process, a two-dimensional unit. So that's why we quote units of surface area in physics for probability of interaction. So the TPC, the liquid xenon TPC, that's setting these aggressive limits in cross-section, how do they work physically? So here are two illustrations from um, a Brown University and Slack, these very nice graphics that show you what's happening in a two-phase liquid xenon TPC. So you have a particle that comes in and it produces what's called the S1, the primary scintillation signal. And from, electro, from, from atoms that are excited, then de-excite and produce light, produce scintillation light. So it produces ultraviolet photons that are then detected by what are called photomultiplier tubes. Those are the circles above and below. There's a, there are also electrons that are completely ripped out of atoms, just like in the original TPC. And just like in the original TPC, they're drifted, in this case through liquid, not through gas. They're drifted through liquid up to the gas, where in the gas, these electrons produce a secondary scintillation pulse, and that's called the S2. So you have two pulses of light. One is small one, initial one called S1, and another larger one called S2. The time between them gives you the depth of the event and the hit pattern of light on the sensors, on the photo sensors, the hit pattern gives you the X and Y, the radial reconstruction. And here, so here's another nice, uh, a more, uh, more modern updated version of that, of that diagram here below uh, showing you what's going on. So you have a primary flash of light and a secondary flash of light. And, and between the two, you get the full three-dimensional position reconstruction, just like in the original TPC design. So a particle can come, comes in, interacts, leaves again. But during that interaction, it excites and ionizes multiple atoms, producing photons, producing electrons, and then those electrons, which are drifted up to the second stage to the gas, also produce photons. So you have, in the liquid xenon TPC, you have only photons you're detecting, not electrons. The electrons are converted into photons in the gas stage. So here's a video also that also, for, this is from the, from the Lux collaboration, which is I've worked on for many years now, um, leading up to LZ. So here's the cathode and anode grids that set up the electric field. Here's the liquid phase. 
And here you've got a lone, here you've got one of the xenon atoms there in purple. And the idea is you have a dark matter particle coming in, strikes one of the atoms. You have the flash of light there. That's the primary scintillation, but you also have electrons that have been ionized that have been liberated from atoms. The electric field drifts them up. They don't diffuse very much. And then they hit the gas stage where they produce a secondary scintillation signal in the gas. And so here you can see the size of the experiment is about half a meter. LZ, which is bigger, will be about 1.5 meters, will be the a ton scale experiment. So how does it work on the inside? So you have either, um, you have these two channels, primary and secondary scintillation. The secondary scintillation comes from charge, comes from electric charge, comes from the electrons that were liberated in the liquid and pulled up into the gas stage. So the, the uh, ratio of S2 to S1 tells you the type of particle that interacted. Was it electron recoil, which I'm going to call capital ER, or nuclear recoil, NR? So electron recoil comes from particles like betas, from gamma rays, from X-rays. These are types of particles that interact with the electrons, with the outermost, with the electron cloud surrounding atoms. But then there's also nuclear recoil from things like neutrons and hopefully um, dark matter particles as well. And neutrinos, neutrinos can produce either type of interaction, but primarily the electron uh, recoil type. So there, so not only are there two channels, but there's also two types, of, two types of interactions. There are others as well. There's alpha particles and other types of radiation, but these are the two main types of interactions. And the, uh, the, if you look at S2 versus S1, you can determine probabilistically what type of interaction did you have microscopically. And by adding the S1 and S2 together, you can get a sense of what the energy was of the interaction. A higher energy interaction will produce more S1 and also produce more S2. So you get more signal, of course, for the higher energy of the interaction. So you have a collision that results in an excited or ionized atom, but that collision, that initial collision creates a chain reaction of uh, as as the first xenon atom that's been collided with collides with its neighbors and that collides with more of its neighbors and so one interaction one initial interaction can lead to tens hundreds th or even thousands or more of xenon atoms that are excited or ionized and scintillation light comes from excited atoms that are raised to a higher energy level and then fall back down and that's how they produce scintillation light. And then ionization comes from completely ripping electrons off of atoms. So while this kind of, you know, solar system model of the atom is very far from perfect, it's kind of a good analogy for me to illustrate what's going on. So electrons can either be promoted to a higher orbital, as I show here, or they can be completely ripped out of atoms and drifted in the electric field uh, in the TPC. The liquid xenon-based TPC has been shown to be sensitive to individual quanta. So experiments like Lux that I work on LZ that's coming can see individual electrons and photons. And that's kind of funny because we've had that ability for decades. But, you know, quantum information science is the big rage right now. But my colleagues and I are always pointing out you know, our experiment has already been sensitive to individual quanta for many years. And so um, I know that quantum this and quantum that is the big rage right now in quantum computers. So, so you should be aware that we've been sensitive to individual quanta. We can count individual electrons and photons um, in our experiments and have already been able to for many years. Now, to be fair, this has nothing to do with all that quantum stuff I just said because we're not sensitive to the, the, the phase of these particles. We're just, you know, counting them. But nevertheless, this is an achievement that should not be understated, that this technology is sensitive to individual electrons and photons, which is, I think, quite an achievement technologically. So something that I've worked on for many years, as Satya mentioned at the beginning, 
is something called the noble element simulation technique, which is, uh, 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 so I've worked on, on physical construction, but I've also worked on the computer programming aspect of, um, of liquid xenon TPCs. And that involves studying what happens, being able to simulate what happens when that initial particle comes in, whatever it is, an X-ray, a gamma ray, a neutron, how does it jiggle around all the xenon atoms and excite and ionize them? So I've de- uh, so working with Professor Moni well, while I was while I was while I was at UC Davis for four years and working with Professor Mani Tripathi, um, I I developed something called the Nest Code Noble Element Simulation Technique that's used actually by multiple different competing experiments, not just by Lux and LZ, but by xenon and by other experiments in order to simulate um, at a semi-empirical level. So while I'm drawing like nice atoms and stuff here, we're still at the semi-empirical level of analytic functions to approximate what's going on here at the atomic and molecular level in order to get things like the amount of light that's produced as a function of energy. So when energy is deposited in liquid xenon or in liquid argon, you have some Atoms are excited, some are ionized, and this chan- oh, the excitation leads to what the S1 channel, and the ionization leads to the S2 channel. But there are all kinds of other arrows and channels here in between for electrons that fail to drift, that get recaptured. That's called recombination. You also have energy that's lost to heat that does not come out in the S1 and S2 channels. So there are a lot of interesting things happening here that we're currently approximating in the NEST code, but we're hoping in the future to move beyond approximate models to molecular dynamics and multi-body quantum mechanical simulations to better understand what's going on so that we're ready when, when we do make, can make a discovery of, of dark matter and we're ready to do neutrino physics by modeling what happens when that dark matter neutrino comes in? What happens at the, the microscopic level? So here is a nice um, animation of what's happening to nuclear and electron recoil. This is uh, animations by uh, Vetri Velon of, 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 of Berkeley um, in California, who's a member of the Lux Collaboration, has produced these nice graphics that are displaying how the energy is divided in xenon into heat, which is not observed, versus excited, versus ionization, and how that splits up into the S1 and S2 signals, which also have unique shapes in time, have different uh, uh, shapes. And so as a function of energy, you'll see these arrows are getting thinner and fatter, because as a function of energy, these different types of interactions, electron and nuclear recoils, will produce different amounts of S1 and S2. And that's what makes the TPC, one of the things that makes the TPC technology so powerful, is that it can distinguish between the different types of interactions, not perfectly, but statistically, probabilistically. And that allows you to distinguish between signal and background noise. So sometimes your signal is nuclear recoil. You're looking for nuclear recoil and you want to ignore electron recoil or you're looking for electron recoil because you're a neutrino experiment, not a dark matter experiment. And so the TPC technology is broadly able to cover all these things. You can see from these um, plots that the biggest difference though between nuclear and electron recoil in these graphics is that Nuclear recoil has a greater loss to heat um, than electron recoil. That reduces the size of both the S1 and S2 signals, which sounds like a bad thing, less signal, but it also helps differentiate nuclear and electron recoils in the TPC. So here's a, a photo of the Lux experiment, which is a titanium cryostat. It's a very old photo now since I said Lux is over, and now LZ is being installed in the same place where Lux was. So this is the titanium cryostat. This is me um, and my post, uh, he was my postdoc at the time. He now works at um, a Slack National Laboratory. This is Dr. Jeremy Mock. And then here are some photos of what the experiment looks like Underneath that skin of titanium, which is basically this titanium cryostat is basically a giant thermos in order to keep the liquid xenon cold because xenon 
is uh, gas at room temperature, of course, so it's kept cold um, in order to liquefy it in this gigantic um, double-walled vacuum cryostat, which essentially I'm using this fancy word cryostat, just think of this as a giant thermos to keep your xenon cold. And um, you here are some photos that my student at the time, Jack Genovese, Genovese, who's now at South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, he took these photos of the disassembly of Lux. They're very similar to photos of the assembly, um, but you can see the titanium, um, the, the top of the titanium cap there. On the inside, you have these copper blocks that house the photomultiplier tubes that detect the ultraviolet scintillation light, and this white stuff you see here, that's Teflon, the same Teflon that's in your nonstick cook pan. So Teflon is remarkably highly reflective in the ultraviolet. And so it's used as sort of a mirror for the light so that it bounces off the sides and makes it to one of the detectors at the top and bottom. So that's a significant difference from the original TPC that only cared about electrons. It didn't care about light, not about photons. So this is a, a, a different step that xenon TPCs use. So while this is Lux, all the competing experiments I mentioned, Xenon, Panda X, have a very similar design with walls made out of Teflon. And here's a picture of me next to my car. License, my license plate actually is Xenon <laughs> um, because it's all cap Xenon. I have been accused of, of, of joining the competing experiment Xenon. I'm on, as I said, I'm on Lux and LZ. But they, you know, they took the name of the element and capitalized it. And, you know, driver's license plates are, license plates are just are always all caps, all capital letters. That's the only option. But that's me in front of my car, my current car where my license plate is Xenon because of how much um, I like this element um, and its uh, technology. So the LZ experiment, again, this is not an LZ talk, and I'm not representing LZ today. I'm trying to give you a broad view, but I want to show a picture of the un different onion layers are going into the LZ experiment. You've got the TPC is at the center, but this the TPC, which is going to be 10 tons total of xenon, is surrounded by multiple layers of different types of detector. There's this... Uh, which is called the liquid scintillator veto, and then there's the um, water tank. And what these different layers do is they basically, they, they not only stop incoming particles, but also help identify what they are. So that when something gets to the TPC at the center, it is more likely to be dark matter or to be a neutrino, which interacts very rarely. So these outer layers serve as what's called vetoes, that veto events that aren't the kinds of signals we are most interested in. So there are these various layers to the experiments nowadays. The xenon, the competing xenon enton experiment, very similar as well, has these layers with a, a water tank and a different type of element, not a noble um, element, not xenon, that then um, but that ha that stop incoming uh, radiation and also can help tag and identify identify it before it gets to the heart of the experiment, which is the two phase liquid xenon TPC here. So here are some photos. So one thing that's very similar to liquid xenon TPCs to liquid argon ones used for neutrino physics and to the original TPC is that you still need grid wires to set up the electric field, and you also still need them to produce that secondary scintillation S2, which comes from your ionization signal. So one thing that's similar to all the TPC technologies is the careful crafting of these very thin metallic wires that help set up the electric field and help extract um, electrons. So a surrounding L, uh, L, the LZ experiment, as I showed in the outer layers, are these additional detectors that help you to determine whether an event was um, a signal that you're interested in, or is it just background radiation? So we have outer layers that allow us to, to basically capitalize on more of the mass. So before 
application of the information from the out the so-called outer detector we would see this many events you can see that you have a lot of events near the walls and top and bottom but you have much fewer in this picture here after you've applied the cuts from applying the information from the outer detector you see much few, many fewer counts fewer events in the center of the experiment so how does the analysis look like? So plots of experimental results are typically shown by putting the so-called S2 signal on the y-axis and the S1 signal on the x-axis. And you can see here, so real experimental results look just like this, but this is a simulation of what the coming LZ experiment will look like. So within the blue band, you have what, what are called the electron recoil background events or ER, which is actually, it, it comes from some background radiation like radon, but is also coming from solar neutrinos. So neutrinos are produced by the sun and they are very interesting obviously to study on their own, but for a dark matter experiment, they kind of get in the way. And so they can leak into this red region where we think the nuclear recoils would be from a dark matter particle. So an example here, 40 GeV is an example dark matter mass for about 40 times heavier uh, than a proton. And down here, you have also in the, in the nuclear recoil region, you have more neutrinos that are very interesting on their own. These are boron-8 neutrinos that come from nuclear fusion in the sun. So they're a byproduct of nuclear fusion in the sun, but they get in the way of a dark matter signal. They're very interesting to study on their own, but also interfere with a dark matter signal. So you can see that we're looking for dark matter squeezed between two neutrino populations. So one scientist signal is another scientist problem. So for when we're looking for dark matter, we're pinched here in the xenon TPC between these neutrino um, uh, interactions here uh, above and below. So we take a plot like the one from this slide and then in the xenon TPC experiments where we're looking for dark matter, we make a plot, that our final results look something like this. So we draw a curve when we don't see anything and we haven't made any conclusive unambiguous detection yet um, at least not of dark matter wimps. We have experiment A, B, C here. They draw these curves and these curves are getting lower and lower and lower. The, the Y axis here is the interaction strength. It's that cross section I mentioned earlier. And the X axis is the mass of the dark matter particle because we don't know what the mass is because we haven't discovered it yet. So we're, a model will look like a blob, and a, a signal, a potential discovery will look like a blob, a circle in this space, whereas we draw these curves lower and lower in this parameter space. So a discovery hasn't been made. We're just basically measuring zero to greater and greater precision so far. That was a cartoon, and this is what the real plot looks like. So this is from the LZ experiment, again, a projection of where it will be in down here. And then these curves here represent real experimental results from Xenon, one ton from Panda X, from Lux. So the different competing earlier experiments. So these curves here are just getting lower and lower and lower. But the hope is, is that one day, instead of drawing a curve, we actually draw a blob, like these gray blobs, which are theoretical models for what the how heavy the dark matter is in the, on the x-axis and what its interaction strength is um, on the y-axis. But we're running into what's called the neutrino floor. So that's yet another different type of neutrino than what was in the plot a couple of slides ago. So eventually we become overwhelmed by neutrinos from the sun, atmospheric neutrinos, supernova neutrinos, which are again all interesting to study on their own, but eventually they become an overwhelming background noise in the search for dark matter as we keep building bigger and bigger. There's been a Moore's law type improvement though over time. So you may have heard of Moore's law from computers that computer processors double every X months in, in, in speed. This is no longer the case, of course, for many years. This is why, you know, you buy a new laptop. It's actually not that much better um, anymore. But I remember when I was a child, 
Moore's law was still very much alive and well in computers. Computers kept doubling in power every few months. It was wonderful. There's been a sort of upside down version of Moore's law. And I, again, to be fair and balanced, I have two versions of this slide from the Xenon experiment and from LZ showing an upside down version of Moore's law where we've been going lower and lower and lower in cross-section space. And Xenon TPCs have been leading the field for high mass dark matter getting going lower and lower in parameter space. So the neutrino floor I just mentioned may slow things down. Um, so this may not continue forever. And another challenge in building bigger and bigger TPCs is maintaining an electric field in the TPC across a larger volume. Discussions are happening right now, though, in the, in the United States as part of something called the snowmass process to determine where physics is going in the future. And we are it, uh, what's on the table, a possibility, is LZ joining forces, perhaps, with Xenon, with Darwin, and building a bigger experiment together, putting our differences aside, and instead of competing, building a larger experiment. And the terminology for this in the U.S. is called G3, a Generation 3 experiment, where LC was Generation 2. So we're not stopped by neutrinos yet. We can still keep going. Liquid xenon-based experiments, though, represent a significant portion of underground xenon experiments around the world. I mentioned already Italy and South Dakota. There's also the Panda X experiment in China at their underground laboratory, CJPL. There was also the X-mass xenon-based experiment, Kamioka, in Japan. So a significant portion of underground experiments use xenon or argon. Um, like the dark side experiment also in Italy for looking for dark matter or for studying neutrinos or for doing both. So at the Sanford Underground Research Facility where I've worked on Lux and LZ has a deep history. This was a former gold mine, the Homestead gold mine at the 4850 foot level. So 4,850 feet. So this is over a kilometer underground. Um, I'm using, obviously, I'm using feet into, you know, experiment based in America, even though it has, you know, it's a broad international collaboration. So I'll have to convert to meters or kilometers. It's well over a kilometer underground. And LZ is being constructed in, in where Lux used to be in the what's called the Davis Cavern which was home to the Nobel Prize winning Ray Davis solar neutrino experiment. So we're hoping, you know, the Nobel Prize gold strikes twice, right, in the same location and we'll make more um, discoveries. But the Davis experiment was the first to determine that, to, to see the first hint that neutrinos coming from the sun, um, that there was something strange about them. He, that there was a, a lower number of them neutrinos than expected. That could be, that's the topic of, its whole, of, a, of a whole seminar on its own. So the dark, I, I promised, I said, so I need to wrap up here in a couple minutes. I promised I wouldn't just focus about dark matter. So another, another uh, way that the Xenon TPC has been leading um, technologically in particle physics is the search for neutrinoless double beta decay. So this is a completely separate thing that has nothing to do with dark matter. And this has to do with the question of whether the neutrino is its own antiparticle or not. And the EXO experiment uses a liquid xenon TPC. It's sideways, unlike up and down, like the LZ and Lux and Xenon experiments. So it's more like the original TPC design. It's sideways, and it does not produce the secondary scintillation. It actually reads the ionization directly for its secondary signal. So it's very similar to Nygren's original design in many ways. And, but Nygren doesn't work on EXO, actually. He works on what's called the NEXT experiment, NEXT, that uses a gaseous xenon TPC to look for neutrinos, double beta decay, as well as for dark matter. And I'm not going to tell you one is better than the other. Again, I'm trying to be fair and equal here everywhere. There are advantages and disadvantages to liquid and gaseous TPCs. So other physics... Other physics that can be done with TBC. So recently, I have to give credit where credit is due to my to our competing experiment, Xenon One Ton, uh, published recently in Nature, the discovery of the rarest process ever ever observed, and it's called two neutrino double electron capture, 
And the lifetime of the process, the half-life, is 10 to the 22 years. That is such a huge number. That is longer than the age of the universe. So even though the TPC has not yet led to discovery of dark matter, it has led to other discoveries. So the reason why you, we can discover such a process with such a long half-life is because even though that's longer than the age of the universe, you might think, but then wouldn't we have to wait longer than the universe to see it? But that's not true because it's all about probability. That's just a half-life. But in a giant vat of liquid xenon, you've got 10 to the very large number of atoms that's comparable to that number of years. And so that's how these kinds of discoveries are made is because you got a big detector. And so you play the, the numbers game of probability and you can still make these discoveries. There's also recently, I should say, an interesting hint from the xenon one ton experiment of what could be a potentially interesting signal, not traditional dark matter, but something else. So the, so the, just like other general technologies, the TPC has led to a lot of the TPC is also used at the LHC. I didn't have time um, to get into that today. There's also something called coherent neutrino scattering. This is where a neutrino interacts directly with the nucleus as a whole. And there's the, the coherent experiment has recently observed coherent scattering in argon. And the red experiment in Russia, the Russian emission detector, is also looking at um, liquid xenon. And so xenon and argon have advantages of being able to um, achieve very low energy threshold to be able to look for this process, which has nothing to do with dark matter, but is interesting for neutrino physics and is also a background for dark matter experiments, as I mentioned earlier, through the boron-8. Now, moving from liquid xenon to liquid argon, this is very brief. I only have a couple slides about argon, not because it's not important, but because it's not my focus today. I work on xenon. But I have to mention dark argon before I conclude, so I just have a couple more slides here. Um, the dark side experiment is a two-phase argon TPC for dark matter detection competing with xenon-based TPCs. There are also non-TPC single-phase argon experiments like Deep and Clean in Canada. And this sounds like it will be very synergistic with the neutrino program. It's not entirely so because the technology is very different. Although, so the argon um, experiments have been competing and also the dark side experiment had a, um, uh, had a world leading result in, in the in ionization only search. So where you only look at the second half of the signal to look at very low energies to look for very uh, low mass dark matter. But the liquid argon TPC is used in neutrino physics. And the principles are very similar. Time between scintillation and ionization gives you the depth. The liquid argon TPC is single phase all liquid, similar to EXO. And the signals are strong enough because this is a completely different energy range you're looking at in neutrino physics with liquid argon TPC so high in energy, mega and giga electron volts, that you actually don't need and you don't want your ionization signal amplified too much. And so this technology um, focuses more on the traditional grid wire approach. It's the technology of choice first for, it was developed by Carlo Rubia for the Icarus experiment. There was, the Dune is going to be using this technology, Microboon Argonut. It's a, it, this technology has been nicknamed the digital bubble chamber for having incredibly high precision images of tracks of particles. So this nice animation here from Brookhaven National Lab shows a track uh, you know, some part, so you see this Y-shaped track, and this comes from, you know, some particle decayed into two other particles, and then it's drifted, the electrons from that track are drifted up to the grid wire planes. Now, this is not the entire story. The two-phase TPC, like dark side for liquid argon, is also being investigated for neutrino physics is being investigated um, at the prototype stage um, for neutrino physics is Andre Rubia, and there's also the... Um, there are the different, there's, there's an attempt to also use the two-phase approach, not just the single-phase liquid. So here are some images. These are real, this real data, not simulations from the Argonut experiment. So unlike in liquid xenon, where you just have points 
And then you focus on these two signals, S1 and S2, but that are fundamentally produced by point-like interactions. Here, you're looking at the ionization and the scintillation across tracks, particles that actually can make tracks millimeters or even centimeters long in the liquid argon at very high energies. So the liquid argon TPCs for neutrino physics have a different, the, the data looks very different than from liquid xenon, but the technology is incredibly, uh, incredibly similar. So I'm going to wrap up here because I'm already a few minutes over time and when I have time for questions. So in conclusion, the TPC is a very broadly useful technology that spans nuclear physics, high energy physics, dark matter, discoveries have been made with it, not dark matter, but double electron capture in liquid xenon, coherent neutrino scattering in liquid argon. And in, the, in, in my primary field that I work on in dark matter, xenon-based TPCs have been leading the search above about 10 GeV in mass for the better part of a decade now. They've been, the xenon-based TPCs have been leading the field with the best results um, in dark matter. Whereas in neutrino physics, we've got argon-based TPCs um, poised to lead in neutrino physics with the largest TPCs on Earth being constructed with liquid argon for the Dune experiment. Many distinct variants of the TPC exist now, both xenon and argon and non-xenon, non-argon have nothing to do with them and gas-based ones versus liquid-based ones and combinations of different technologies, both underground as well as on the surface. These are now very becoming very well understood experiments through very high intensity calibrations, as well as through excellent simulation modeling of the internal physics. So I will, I will stop there and happily take um, any questions. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, for your excellent uh, lecture, where you really covered uh, very beautifully the workings of uh, the xenon, of course, argon, both the variants of uh, uh, the TPCs. Of course, you also uh, talked started by uh, you know very generic uh, TPC design and the working principle, and also you touched upon quite a few uh, current, past, current, as well as the future applications. Uh, uh, that the TPC is going to play a major role both in dark matter, NDPD, uh, neutrino physics, and so on, so on and so forth. It's very also interesting that uh, you made nice connections with the quantum uh, related uh, aspects to the TPC, where you also can measure the quanta. Uh, this is very interesting uh, the way you connected up uh, these kind of uh, topics at the same time, of course, focusing on the workhorse of all the futuristic uh, sensitive experiments, which is the TPC. Uh, yeah, definitely we wished we had more time where we could have even allowed you to digress into the applications, a little more uh, interesting applications in detail, but maybe we, we can do that at some other point in time. Uh, so thank you very much. But before I take questions from the participants, uh, I must also remember to thank uh, my good old friend, Mani Tripathi, uh, uh, who actually introduced uh, both of us. And uh, of course, he was from UC Davis and we have been known uh, to us from the CMS days and we continue to uh, be in touch with on many aspects. So thanks to Mani uh, for introducing such a lovely speaker. Okay. So with that, uh, let us go into questions. We have uh, one question straight away from Professor uh, Vivek, Vivek Dathar. Uh, can you please ask? I can't hear. Yeah, he's. Uh... Yeah, I've unmuted. I've unmuted myself. Uh, okay. I can hear you now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question relates to the uh, you know to the possibility of using solid xenon as a detector. Uh, what are the temperatures that you are talking about? Is there a possibility that a, a phononic signal can also be extracted from such a detector? If you go to yes, lower enough temperatures. 
Yes, yes, it is possible. So, so yeah, so there, there's some very interesting potential advantages to solid xenon. As I said, though, it's not something I work on, but I mentioned a few physicists. There's Michelle Delinsky, Peter Sorensen at Berkeley who are considering this. There are some technical challenges like being able to uh, make sure you have a uniform crystal to be able to drift the electrons. Um, but there are many advantages like freezing in your backgrounds. Like mm -hmm. you're, you know, you've got radon, yeah. which is bad, right? Radon backgrounds. But if you freeze, then the atoms can no longer move around. Um, but you could have, you could have potentially lattice vibrations. You're absolutely right. You could have a phonon signal from the lattice vibrations could add an additional channel, a third yeah. channel beyond S1 and S2. So mm -hmm. I, that is, I believe that is being actively investigated by colleagues of mine, friends I know who are actively investigating that possibility. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, we have the next question from Shailesh Pincha. Uh, uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, my uh, first question is, uh, while the xenons are undergoing chain reaction, uh, they can't probably detect another dark matter particle. So. Although dark matter interactions are very rare, will that affect our detection or not? So let me let me back up to the appropriate slide. So yeah, no, dark matter would not multiply scatter. It's way too rare. So what I yeah. meant, what I meant by a chain reaction of Zena atoms, let me go back to the appropriate slide. What I meant is that the initial reaction can kick one, if you look at my diagram here at upper right, one. So this, this Greek letter chi that looks like an X, that's typically a stand-in for dark matter particle. More specifically refers to the neutralino, but it's also come to stand for dark matter in general. So you see this little X or chi particle. So it hits only one atom. You're absolutely right. It can only hit one atom of xenon or argon. But then if it kicks that one xenon atom hard enough, it gives it enough energy that is so much greater than the thermal energy of the surrounding xenon atoms, that it's kind of like throwing a bowling ball among pins. So that one xenon atom starts to kick and bump into other xenon atoms, exciting and ionizing them. So it is not a multiple scatter. So all of this happens microscopically within nanometers. So from dark matter, you cannot get, you're not going to get multiple interaction sites. You can get multiple interaction sites from, from gamma rays, for example, but you cannot get multiple interaction sites from dark matter. So in the TPC, it would look like a point, not a track. So the TPC does not have the ability to resolve the xenon TPC with liquid does not have the ability to resolve this as a track. It would be, it's a track only microscopically there. Unlike in the argon TPCs with very, very high energy interactions, there you have a track from a neutrino and you have multiple, you have a very long track. But from dark matter, this is a point like interaction that starts with one atom. It bumps into other neighboring atoms, but those neighbors are all very close at the nanometer scale. Thank you. Yeah. And I have uh, uh, another question. Okay. Uh, coincidentally, I read uh, a very old article yesterday about some new technology they are trying at next experiment mm -hmm. that was related to some uh, thing they read in biochemistry. It was like uh, the dye, uh, dye tagging in calcium ions can fluoresce give fluorescence. So the similar thing they were trying that would uh, the corresponding signal will, will be different from all the other backgrounds except for the neutrino less double beta decay signal and the uh, two neutrino beta decay signal. So I haven't followed the uh, progress of that uh, report, but I would like to know if uh, that was a good option. What are its uh, op other options? Sure. So yeah, I mentioned it, but only very briefly. So the next experiment is, yeah, it's actually, so Dave Nygren, the originator of TBC is working on it and the, it's a gas xenon TBC, but not just xenon. As you mentioned, they're exploring other technologies, doping, adding different chemicals to try to improve the, the performance of the TBC. So the next experiment, yeah. the advantage is better energy resolution and potentially directionality. 
So not just track, but the ability to tell the direction that a particle is traveling. They don't, but the potential disadvantage is less mass. So by having a gaseous TPC, you would have less mass than liquid. But again, you know, all these have advantages and disadvantages. If Dave Nygren were here, of course, he would argue, no, it's, it's much better. There's no disadvantage. So everyone always pushes, of course, for their technology. But I'm trying to be balanced. The, the disadvantage is less mass. The advantage is potentially better resolution, energy resolution, position resolution, but also potentially one of Dave Nygren's big new ideas in the next experiment you mentioned is the potential to see the direction of the interaction, which would be useful not just for neutrinos double beta decay, more importantly for dark matter, because for dark, dark matter should only be coming from one particular direction in the sky as the earth moves around the sun. So those are, those are the advantages and disadvantages of, of that new approach. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. That's nice. Uh, we still have a couple of more questions on Zoom. I'll come back yep. in a second. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, let me take at least one question uh, from the YouTube. Uh, okay, uh, it's possible some of these questions are kind of uh, answered at a later time because they come in uh, in some temporal uh, manner. So uh, this is Disha Bhattis. Uh, what happens to energy reconstruction when the photon doesn't travel along the z-axis but uh, along any arbitrary direction? Uh, because photomultiplied tubes are present only at the top and the bottom direction. I mean, detector. That's what uh, she said. Uh, so that's that's a great question. So I will answer that with a photo. Okay. So this is yeah, this is the reason why we have Teflon on the sides. Yes. So the Teflon acts like a mirror, and so so to to bounce the bounce. Now there are different TPC designs for the future, and I believe the EXO experiment upgrading to NXO is no longer doing reflectors on the wall, but it's just doing just doing photo sensors all around, not PMTs, but a similar kind of silicon photomultipliers. So yeah, the answer is you either have a reflective wall or you build with with sensors not just at the top and bottom, but also on the sides. So we 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 take care of that. Yeah, we we solve that problem. So let me take one from Deepak, uh, Deepak Samuel. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, in slide 29, uh, so you mentioned that there wouldn't be any S2 signal. So, yes. so, so then how do you get the drift time? So there is an ionization signal. It's just not converted into light. So there is ionization. So sorry, what I meant by no S2 is it's not converted into photons in a gas stage. It's an all liquid single phase. So the, the, you do get the Z, the Z position from the drift time between the initial scintillation, and, which is measured in photomultiplier tubes or a similar technology. And then the, these grid wires directly, the grid wires directly detect the ionization just like in the original TPC from the 70s. So it, it, it you still get drift from ionization. You just don't convert the ionization into scintillation. So it's, it's the same thing. It's just a, it's a, it's a slightly different technology choice, but you still get the drift time. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Disha Bhattis again. Can you please also explain the Mitkal eff effect? I'm not sure I'm reading it rightly, where the dark matter gives signals similar to electronic recoil. Uh, how does one differentiate them with usual electronic recoils? So the Migdal effect, yes, M I, I believe, it, M I G D A L. Yes, is that correct? Yes, okay, yes. yes, Migdal effect. Yes, I know exactly what that. That's a, a, that's a brand new idea. Well, not new. I shouldn't call it new because the Migdal paper is decades old, I believe. But the idea is, let me go back to this slide. Um, the idea is, is that when you have a um, nuclear recoil. The question is, well, what happens to the electrons when dark matter or a neutron, for example, in a neutron calibration, it bumps into the nucleus. Okay, but what happens to the electrons? Are they along for the ride? And so the, the idea behind the Migdal effect is that there's also, that when you have a nuclear recoil, there's also an electron recoil signal that looks like what you'd get from betas or gammas. That's correct. So our current understanding of it is, so we do not have, we do not yet have a direct calibration of what the Migdal effect looks like in liquid xenon. So we are relying on simulations and models. And, the, and how would you differentiate it? 
um, it would be by the combination of, of seeing um, a nuclear recoil-like signal with additional light, with additional energy. It is tricky, though. It is absolutely becomes tricky. Um, and, and so in, in one sense, it's, it's an advantage, though, because even though you don't want your signal to look more background-like, like electron recoil, the adv potential advantage is the ability to look for dark matter at, at lower masses with less energy because you get you can effectively transmit more energy into the electron recoil channel so in fact there's a lux paper on this there's a world leading result from xenon one ton our competitor on this for studying looking for the absence of a migdal signal to be able to constrain further at low masses a, a dark matter signal so migdal's effect is very interesting as i said and it's mixed it's both in a disadvantage but also an advantage that allows us to look deeper um, at lower masses for lower energies of, of nuclear equal. But I should stress again, like I said, even though, you know, it uses standard physics to derive the effect, it has not been directly observed and calibrated in liquid xenon, but we still, we simulate and we, res and we are, we trust our, our, our models of the mid effect to be able to set um, limits on it, even though it has not been directly observed. Uh, let us take one more question from Zoom. This is from Ariom. Uh, let yeah. me, yeah, please. Yeah, hello, sir. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Sir, at slide uh, 27, uh, mm -hmm. can you go? Slide number 27. Um, yeah, sir, you, you talked about this uh, neutrino coherent interaction. Yes. So there are many interaction. This in, co in coherent interaction, this neutrino interacts as a whole, right, to the nucleus. So, yes. Uh, in the case of this TPC, why only this interaction like you are talking about? There are many such interactions, right? This neutrino, uh, like deep elastic scattering. Uh, there are many such uh, interactions. Why, in this case of TPC, why it is like why you are focusing on this? Well, because the uh, the there was a discovery first in germanium, but then an Ar a confirmation in argon of coherent neutrino scattering. So the connection was the argon technology was used in this uh, in this uh, paper I quote here in order to do the uh, an, an additional observation of coherent scattering. So the advantage of the noble element TBC technology for coherent scattering is that coherent neutrino scattering is a very non-standard neutrino interaction. It's not like the others you mentioned because it's so low in energy. It can show up at sub KV energy. So it's ex many orders of magnitude away from the traditional neutrino interactions. So one one of the advantages you have is by do, by looking at these low energy signals that you can get from very, very low energy thresholds where you're counting individual electrons and photons, as, I, as I'd mentioned, allows you to see coherent neutrino scattering in, for example, liquid argon experiment or liquid xenon one. Liquid xenon has not seen this uh, coherent elastic yet, but liquid argon has. So the coherent experiment has this um, a publication I, I, I cite here. This is a very recent March of, of this year. So only a few months ago with an ob observation of uh, coherent scattering in liquid argon. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, even though, uh, Matthew, you did uh, say that you don't want to I uh, don't have time to get in too much uh, between uh, Zinan and Argon, but uh, if you want to add some more lines, there was a question from Abhinav Chaudhary. What is the basic, just a second, uh, difference between Zinan based and liquid Argon based time projection chamber and which one is better? <laughs> oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> oh, so I'll, I'll tell. So I'm going to try to be balanced because okay. there are advantages and disadvantages. So okay. the main, there are several differences. So the liquid argon time projection chamber for dark matter relies on pulse shape discrimination in the S1. So they have an S2 signal for position reconstruction, but they rely, they don't rely on S2 versus S1 to describe. To, to tell the difference between nuclear and electron recalls, they use the shape of the primary simulation signal S1. This has advantages where at high energies for high mass dark matter, it has the ability to differentiate between signal and background potentially better than liquid xenon. However, in order to capitalize on that pulse shape discrimination, you also need a higher energy threshold because you need a lot of photons to be able to capitalize on that. 
So then the liquid xenon experiments, even though xenon's a heavier atom, so this is kind of counterintuitive, at low masses, the liquid xenon does better. And even at high masses, the liquid xenon is still leading the world above 10, 50 GV in dark matter because it has other advantages like a higher density. So the higher density of liquid xenon means that you have fewer backgrounds in the edges of the detector. So again, obviously working on xenon, I'm going to be biased in favor of the xenon experiments. Now, argon, xenon is also more expensive than argon. However, that's only if you use regular argon. So for a neutrino experiment, that's fine. That's why, you know, I would love there to be a multi kiloton scale liquid xenon experiment. There isn't enough xenon on earth to do that. Um, and, and, and there isn't also, um, uh, and, and that would be, you know, I don't remember how many billions of dollars. So it's not realistic for a large scale neutrino experiment, but for dark matter, the question is, can you do a dark matter experiment with natural xenon? Because underground xenon basically drives the cost back up similar to liquid xenon ex experiments. And so there's, and again, if you ask someone from uh, who works on liquid argon experiment, the same question you just asked me, of course, they'll counter all uh, with arguments, everything I just said, but that's sort of my answer answer about, you know, the advantages about background discrimination versus cost and, and density. Um, in, so I, I hope that that was a nice summary of what I think the strengths and, and weaknesses are. Yeah, sure, indeed. Uh, so uh, I think that answered uh, all the questions, both on YouTube and Zoom link. Uh, so it is also time now uh, to thank Matthew for, on behalf of all the participants and also on behalf of the project, uh, which is being, I know project, which is being you know, organizing this uh, series of lectures. Uh, so, and of course, we are going to see you back soon uh, with another very interesting uh, lecture on Snowball. So with that, uh, we want to thank you, Matthews, for your time that you took uh, and giving this excellent lecture and also uh, answer, you know, patiently answering all the questions from the participants. So we'd like to say bye and uh, say take care and uh, stay safe and hope to see you soon. Very bad. Thank you. And, you too. And, uh, yeah. So I'll also take, uh, before I close the uh, today's session, I also would like to uh, once again announce that the next talk on this series is going to be on Wednesday at 6 p.m., which is going to be by Professor James Libby from IIT Madras. He's going to talk on the Bell 2 uh, flavor physics and more at the intensity frontier. So please join us back on uh, uh, on 5th August, Wednesday at 6 p.m. So thank you very much and uh, good night. Take care.